Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this Goggle Docs video where we'll be previewing the American Diabetes Association's annual conference. This year it's in sunny Florida uh, and will be taking place just later on in this month of June. So today we're actually going to highlight the, the key areas that we think are going to be really interesting, perhaps will have an impact on clinical practice as well. Um, and actually this year, Patrick, it seems as though there's a real focus, as there has been for a few years now, on the incretins. Uh, particularly the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, and there's one particular study, I think, that stands out for you. Yeah, so it's not a, an action-packed uh, 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 ADA this year, I think it's fair to say. But the, the one study which um, certainly stuck out to me was Surmount OSA. So we got some headline data uh, on this. Well, in fact, it's two studies which they've put together, but we got um, the a company announcement uh, in April, which showed that uh, both 10 and 15 milligram uh, reduced um, OSA uh, episodes, uh, or at least um, the uh, AHI uh, index, uh, which I'm sure we all know about, and but more importantly, I think Amar does. Um, so I think this was, and we, we had a Bit of a chat before, Amar. There was that you you were thought that was of some interest, um, but there were some other parameters which you thought were particularly that you were wanting to look at because we've only got the top line. The, we, this is when we should get a lot of the uh, detail in terms of this study. Yeah, I mean, we, I guess, even from a clinical side of things, we've been aware that weight loss helps with sleep apnea in terms of symptoms. Um, from, from, from the you know, first and second generation GLP-1s that we were using as well. So we know incretins work that way. And so um, it's always been kind of one of my considerations from a clinical perspective. Now this trial is actually the, with a, a key trial looking at tisepatide in that setting, so 10 and 15 milligrams in people who are on positive airway pressure and weren't and you know, placebo versus tisepatide. Um, and the data suggests that yes, it reduces the number of, um, so the AHI is the apnea, so, you know, stopping breathing and hypopnea, so reduced breathing and, 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 and closed airways um, episodes per, per hour. Um, and it said it reduced it. There was a, a significant reduction in the, in, in the episodes with tisepatide. Now, that's the headline data. For me, what I really want to know is actually the, the, the other parameters, the secondary outcomes, the other parameters of, of the, the patients and the participant-specific kind of um, uh, outcomes, what they found was relevant, what, what actually helped them with it, what, what was their sleepiness, what the daytime somnolence, what was their quality of life impact, how did it impact their lives? Because that's probably the more important thing in the Nutterstand. So we know weight loss and we know the reduction in weight from tisepatide is significant. So we know it will have some impact, let me show that, but it's, it's that the degree of that impact and actually to our patients that we see, what might we possibly expect? So for me, that's probably the key thing from this trial. I'm just I'm not identifying a bit more about that and teasing that out. And I think that's the key thing um, which I would want to find out. Yeah, certainly. So I don't know about you, Amrit, but I don't have many patients coming to me asking about their AHI index. They usually come in saying I'm feeling exhausted all the time. I'm falling asleep, you know, or, or just don't have the energy or at the same time, you're also it's a spectral disease it's the snoring which is uh, uh which is the the thing which is you know destroying their relationships so so i think it would be lovely to see if there was improvements in those patient orientated outcomes really because it's as you say use of cpap in fact as well as you mentioned sorry i've cut in now but saying use of cpap yeah. people are able to come off positive air pressure uh, machine that's what i'm interested in i'd love to see what effect it has on people who are already using cpap will they be able to reduce their usage of it or not, because C using CPAP is is no simple thing, really, is it? It's uh, it's quite an ordeal, and <clears throat> some people don't tolerate it as well, don't they? So <clears throat> that would be really interesting. Yeah, no, I agree on that. Um, I mean, one thing I was thinking about is that um, uh, OSA isn't necessarily diagnosed so easily, is it? We often have to, you know, refer. First of all, it's about being aware. Is uh, is the person experiencing symptoms suggestive of? and having signs suggestive of. And then it's a referral process, quite a lengthy referral process actually to get be, to get seen in a, in a clinic, have sleep studies, et cetera, et cetera. So potentially we may get on with managing it using a molecule that is going to be prescribed and is being prescribed in primary care. So we may actually find we're not diagnosing OSA in the traditional sense and just getting on and treating it 
through some of these uh, symptoms that you mentioned, Patrick, uh, which obviously will benefit patients. But uh, that from the technical side of diagnosing OSA, there, there may be changes there, and it may result in changes to local pathways as well. And of course, I suppose if we just think about it as a treatment spectrum, and obviously that, that's looking at a particular complication, which we know is underdiagnosed and underrecognized. So, um, but if, if, but is there an opportunity here with more of a weight centric approach to managing uh, type 2 diabetes, for example, or, which obviously is a, a risk factor for, for developing uh, OSA, then we can actually you know, prevent it in the first place. Um, so it's, um, but yeah, uh, anyway, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see, but I, as you say, we need those patient orientated outcomes really, which uh, uh, would be. Um, it's, it's interesting when you say that clinic, changing clinical practice. Um, if, if someone didn't have OSA, I mean, this trial is looking at people who have, a, have OSA, so it is kind of, we can only pertain to that. Um, Again, it's that obesity management, isn't it? And even before, and the weight management, regardless, it just doesn't change too much. But I guess in the person you see who does have sleep apnea and is overweight, but doesn't have diabetes, <laughs> type 2 diabetes, in this is, then it kind of puts more, I guess, resource management in terms of who with obesity you're going to manage. Everyone with obesity, or, you know, as we've always said, the people with the highest risks and, and benefits and cost effectiveness, I guess, it, it kind of puts that in as a consideration. Yeah. The reason I mentioned type 2 diabetes is simply because we've got no major barrier in terms of access for patients if they've got type 2 diabetes. But of course, if they don't have type 2 diabetes, then access in the UK is is um, going to be dependent on people paying out of pocket uh, costs. Um, so, so it, and it, that might change, but even then accessing these through a degree of specialized weight management clinics that the, there are still significant issues in terms of accessing currently at least so um so i suppose it was mainly in terms of my patients with type 2 diabetes i was suddenly thinking actually you know i i spent a lot of time screening for this condition maybe if i just manage things more um aggressively from the get-go i don't even need to worry too much about it because I'm, maybe i'm actually preventing it in the first place so I suppose it's the same learning that we got with SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure. Um, for in type 2 diabetes, you know, we do know if you prescribe enough of it, you might actually prevent some people going on at least to develop symptomatic heart failure because you've given them a treatment as, you know, for their, their diabetes or, or, or CKD, for example. We're spreading our specialty. We've got uh, cardiologists and nephrologists interested, and they're going to get hepatologists, and now we're going to get uh, respiratory physicians involved now, are we? <laughs> yeah, the, the obesity, obesity game rolls on, doesn't it? Uh, drawing in people, I suppose the, the diabetes game as well, uh, overlapping with that. So <clears throat> yet another yet another positive outcome, it seems, for this for this class of medication, although this is now uh, the twin quatrins, isn't it? So. Um, so now, um, Amit, the, the rest of the ADA program uh, has some interesting things, uh, perhaps not those blockbuster trials that we've looked forward to in the past, but still some uh, things that have stood out for you that might, again, have some interest for those um, looking to, to, to find something to watch um, either remotely or in person at ADA. So yeah, we, we always, um, with these conferences, there are always a number of different sessions that you know, quite common with the conferences, things such as cell phone urea use, um, liver health, cardiometabolic health, and all these kind of things. Um, and they're always, you know, they're always good kind of topics to go and see. But for me, I guess there are two main areas that I've seen, probably slightly on the newer side, I've not always seen before. I think those are the ones I would focus on. So one is, you know, continuing the trend with incretins. Um, it was looking at the the non, you know, the other effects of of the of GLP ones, not on obesity and diabetes, but on the brain and the central nervous system. Uh, and this is an area, you know, close to my heart with cognitive impairment. Um, they do talk about it a little bit in that session, looking at neuro neurodegeneration, um, and there's a lot of data looking at incretins and GLP ones in that setting. But for me, there are two kind of areas they're looking at it and going to talk about, which I thought was more fascinating. One was about uh, the increased use in alcohol misuse disorders. And there's been a lot of interest in this um, and some recent, I remember having some recent discussions with people about, about 
the use of incretins in this setting, and there are some trials coming out looking at it as well. And it's all centered around kind of, I guess, reward centers, the higher level functioning in the brain, and the impact of incretins on brain activity, because we know there's you know, GLP-1 receptors in the brain. Um, so I'd be interested to see what that shows and what the kind of data they discuss to kind of give us an idea whether you know, there's something to be considered uh, or looked at. Um, I don't know you know, future data will tell us that. But the other thing is also about the use of GLP-1 and, and thirst and impact on thirst. And I think, again, this is also coming quite fascinating to give us an insight into kind of some of the mechanistic sides of things of, of these molecules and these medications that we, we use, but perhaps don't fully understand the full range of function or impact on the person. So I think it's, those would be quite interesting, something that I, I will certainly dial into to, to listen. Um, I guess the only other thing I would say um, in terms of other sessions, there's another one looking at, so we know about continuous glucose monitoring and technology and how important it's changed in your type 1 diabetes care. And actually, you know, people talking about it in type 2 diabetes a lot now and perhaps, you know, starting to use it a bit more. But for me, I guess it's more about the setting of its use. And, and this, 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 there's, a, there's an oral session looking at continuous glucose monitoring in the inpatient in the patient setting. So again, a specific area, a specific population that is quite important, um, something that's relevant across the world really, and certainly from the UK, from our side, I think uh, people, a lot of people are looking at seeing how best can we use CGM in this setting, how, you know, how will the support us, not just in specific environments, maybe everyone with diabetes or in certain situations. It'd be interesting to see kind of these are uh, people talking about their experiences of it. So again, gaining insights from them and how they use it and seeing how we would consider it in in our practice in the UK would be quite fascinating, I think, from, from my side as a secondary care clinician. So um, that's another one that I think is is quite worth checking. Yeah, and I think just on that, just finally, I know you're keen to wrap up, uh, Amrit, but I'll, I'll, I'll just be try to be brief. Um, there is actually a randomized control study, actually, a tight study, which is also highlighted uh, later in the agenda as well. So maybe, and that's looking at CGM, in intensive glucose control using CGM versus standard of care um, uh, in type two diabetes in an inpatient setting. So, so it, it's um, so yeah. I think so. There, there'll definitely be some learnings from that. And I think, uh, as you say, we, we, you know, it shouldn't be just type one that we're using this, uh, particularly in these vulner more vulnerable people. But we've got to learn about exactly where the sweet spot is and and how best to manage it. Um, so yeah, it, that's probably worth a, a tune in. Um, and, and then the only other thing I would say, which is just building on what you've already said, Amar, was there was a session about some of the new mechanisms in terms of weight loss, um, which I suspect will highlight some of these higher centers. Uh, when you were talking about GLP-1 in the brain, uh, I'm thinking, ah, oh, but now we've got twinkatrins and, uh, and, 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 you know, trigonists. And again, are we going to start learning about the other incretins and, and receptors within the brain um, with these newer generation of, of molecules which do penetrate into the brain? So anyway, we'll... Um, there's um, there is still stuff to be uh, gleaned in all of this. Um, so uh, and I'm sure we'll feed back. Um, definitely, definitely. You can tell that ADA is like it's one for the nerds, isn't it? It really is, because there's there's the, the headline uh, headline acts in a way. And then there are all these really interesting um, uh, other scientific discussions and sessions, aren't there? So uh, I think, as you say, there's plenty that we can. Uh, discuss after the conference as well some really interesting things that you mentioned particularly around the, the behavioral impacts of GLP-1 I, I think that's going to be really interesting um, but um, and yeah and of course CGM uh, in inpatients as we're just getting used to it in primary care really this is looking at it from a different lens isn't it um, so thanks guys for your for your thoughts there uh, we look forward to actually attending the ADA we're going to be attending it virtually um, this year and uh, we'll be uh, sharing our insights and keeping up to date uh, across our social media channels so please do look out for that uh, if you enjoyed this video please do subscribe to us like us send us a comment and uh, we'll be happy to interact with you um, so until next time see you then bye